Good morning and welcome to our message for this Sunday morning, 21st of February 2021. We are doing our series of Paul's Prayers. Now, I have found four of them, and there are many others. I have found four of them, and we're just going through them for our mutual benefit. Now, this morning, I would like us to turn to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. I'm going to read from chapter 1 and just verses 15 to 19. Ephesians chapter, 5, chapter 1, verses 15 to 19. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gracious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength. Well, let's just take some time and look at that passage, those few verses, phrase by phrase, and see what we can learn from them. First of all, may I just please say this, the book of Ephesians is a treasure house of the truths of God. Now, particularly these first 14 verses, you can spend many, many hours meditating on that. And I would really recommend, if you've got some time spared, just spend some time reading Ephesians chapter 1, maybe this afternoon, and just enrich your soul in these wonderful, wonderful treasures of the truths of God's Word. But we need to focus on verses 15 through to verse 18. Verse 19 isn't really part of Paul's prayer. Now, let's just look at this. And um, first of all, Paul starts off like this. Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints. Now, what he's given us here is two characteristics of Christians. He's given us the characteristic of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love for saints. I must tell you that the first leads to the second. Love for saints is not something we generate in ourselves, but it is something that comes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is a command of Jesus, of course. We'll look at that in a moment. But equally, it comes through the enabling of God that we can love our brothers and sisters in Christ more and more as we walk the Christian path. So, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the number one thing. We, of course, know that. It's highlighted in the New Testament. Let me just read Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So there we have the two terms. Again, uh, that's uh, in a slightly different context. And then, of course, love for one another, um, which is the command of Jesus, as I mentioned a moment ago. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Greater love has no man, that he lays down his life for his brother, indeed his sister. So that's the first thing that Paul mentions. He's not just giving a general prayer, one of these things, Oh Lord, please bless everyone in the country, please bless the world today, etc., etc. One of those uh, almost very fuzzy and sadly prayers that have virtually no meaning at all. No, he's focusing on people who are genuinely believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and love is demonstrated in them. Now, this is what he says in verse 16. I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Just a very slight little deviation here. Detour, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. 
uh, reminds us of the importance of thanksgiving in our prayer lives. Chapter 4, verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your prayers be made known to God. So thanksgiving actually should be an important part of our prayer and spiritual lives. But what Paul says is he actually gives thanks for them. Uh, he's read, he, he's heard of their faith and love, and he think, he thanks God every time he remembers them. I wonder if you've got people, Christians, in your life experience, your spiritual walk, who whenever you think of them, you thank God for their ministry. Most certainly I have some. There are some that uh, certainly helped me along my early faith, some who've encouraged me uh, a number of years after I was, I was a believer, others who've given me li uh, uh, advice and guidance, even, even as a mature Christian. I must tell you that, yes, it's a great pleasure to thank God for them. Also, sometimes as I read some of the spiritual books and commentaries which help me put together sermons and Bible studies, I thank God for these authors because they contribute so much to me and they contribute so much to you as well. So there's lots and lots that we can give thanks for and there are particular people that we can give thanks for as well. So, but that's not only the thanks that Jesus gives that sorry that Paul mentions here I not I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers there's the important part as I remember you in my prayers now what he's saying here is that in his prayers he so often prays for others my goodness how often isn't it true that our prayers get so self-centered? We are obsessed with praying about our possessions, the wealth we have, our position in life, what we're hoping to do that next holiday. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray about these things, but they've taken a kind of precedence that shouldn't be there. There are people we can pray for. Uh, maybe to remind us we need to make lists and it doesn't matter how long that list is it might have five names might have 50 maybe you're very enthusiastic and might have 500 but there are people that we can pray for and as I'll mention again a bit later there are specific prayers that we can actually bring we need to pray specific prayers that God would uphold people that we understand they're serving the Lord and uh, seeking uh, his blessing and we can uphold them in our prayer so paul says i pray for you now he tells us what he prays for them i pray that the god of our lord jesus christ the god of our glory sorry the glorious father let me read that again i pray that the god of our lord jesus christ the glorious father would give you two things a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him wisdom revelation wisdom revelation there are two kinds of wisdom that are particularly mentioned in scripture there's a worldly wisdom and there's a worldly wisdom that informs people how to get on in life, how to make friends and influence people, how to have success, how to get wealth, how to live a happy and pleasant life. Uh, the, all of these things are a worldly kind of wisdom. On the contrary, there is also a godly wisdom. Let me read you to you from James chapter 3, verse 17 it tells us about this wisdom the wisdom that is from above is pure peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy so that's describing somebody who's received this godly wisdom peaceable and pure 
Then, of course, there's a very important verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And uh, I think we need to pay a lot, a lot of attention to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says, Of him you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. In Jesus, the wisdom of God is made known to us, and we can learn about it as well. So our wisdom actually comes from Christ. And it's a spiritual wisdom. It's a spiritual wisdom about eternal issues, heaven, resurrection, prayer, the word of God, obedience, worship. There's a kind of wisdom that fills the hearts and minds of God's people who are prepared to listen to that wisdom. Going back to the book of James once once more, James chapter 1 verse 5 assures us of this. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives it to everyone liberally without reproach, it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind so there's our connection with faith and prayer again prayer and faith those two must go together right so he talks paul says i pray that you would have wisdom and revelation revelation this is a point that is vitally important we need to make a distinction here about certain errors that have occurred, pitched up in the church over many centuries, and particularly, I think, over the last 40 or 50 years. We must never doubt that the Holy Spirit ministers to people. Holy Spirit opens minds. The Holy Spirit guides. The Holy Spirit leads us in prayer. The Holy Spirit uh, can give us pieces of information that would be otherwise impossible for us to know. But there are people who believe that they have a message from God for all Christians which they must obey. I have a revelation from the Lord. I've heard such things myself. Well, no. No. If it is a word for all the people, then our revelation is final and complete. It is the Scriptures. And so when the Scriptures talk about Revelation, Genesis to the book of Revelation, well, here we have the mind of God, all that needs to be known to lead the Christian life. Here it is. We don't need somebody else saying, but, oh, I've got a new message of God for you, and that you must do this, and you must do that, and you must light a candle and have little crystals, and you must have incense, and you must bow down and pray three times a day, and you must and not eat meat. Well, I've heard all of, all of this stuff. No, those are not messages. That's not a revelation. That's somebody's pride, somebody's ego, uh, maybe even an evil spirit uh, beginning to try and confuse the people of God. And here's the second point about revelation. We cannot know God through our own investigation. You can climb the highest mountain. You can go to the deepest sea. You can read all the books in all the universities of the world. You will still not know God. You see, in order for God to be known, He is so great. He is spirit. He is so glorious. He must reveal Himself. And He has done so through Christ Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus through faith, God reveals himself to us. Isn't that true? As we walk the Christian life, we should know more about God now than when we were young believers. It is true. Our faith grows. Our knowledge of God grows, yes, because we're reading the scriptures and we're hearing his word, but it also grows particularly because he is revealing himself to us. So, yes, you can know some things about God. Uh, if you look at creation, you can know about his creativity. You can know a little bit about his power. 
Um, you can know about the attention he gives to detail, but you still do not know God until he reveals himself to you through the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. So that's what Paul is praying for here. I pray that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The more we know God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit, the more we know him, the more effectively we can love and serve him. Paul has two more prayers, two more petitions. They now come in verse 18. I pray that the perception of your mind, or in the original it says the eyes of your heart, which was uh, a way in those days of talking about the same thing, the perception of your mind. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is this, the hope of his calling and the glorious inheritance among the saints and his immeasurable greatness of his power. There are three things there. He's praying that their minds may be enlightened. That's what's happened. Your minds may be enlightened. That you may know three things. The hope of his calling. The glorious riches of his inheritance. And the immeasurable greatness of his power. Let's look at that for a moment. Owing to sin. Our minds have been corrupted from the truth of God. Totally apart from that, we are mere human beings. And our minds are naturally limited as to what knowledge we can have simply as humans. So what Paul is praying here is for a divine intervention that that ability to understand may be enlarged that your mind may be enlightened all of us have had some of those aha experiences uh, certainly when i was studying mathematics and physics and telecommunications there were some subjects that i really really struggled over and a little detail falls into place like a, a piece of a of a jigsaw puzzle and you have aha suddenly i, I understand this well, that's purely a human a description, but there are spiritual truth where suddenly we can say, Aha! My understanding, my mind's been opened. I now see this in a way that I never saw it before. So your our mind is enlightened so that you may know three things. Here they are. The hope of his calling. The hope of of his calling you know none of us believe because we decided to believe the scriptures talks about the calling of god god calls us to faith in jesus christ it's something complex it's deeply spiritual and we as humans do not fully understand it but this calling has a great hope now, I've dealt with this in other places. Scriptural hope is this. It's not a wishy-washy thing like, I hope the weather's good tomorrow. Scriptural hope is this. We've been given promises, but we haven't got them now. We know we will receive them. It's just we still haven't got them now. That's what scriptural hope is. What is the hope of his calling? Well, here are some of the things. You will not be dead. You've been given eternal life and you will rise from the dead. Resurrection is part of that hope. That eternal life I mentioned is part of that hope. No more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more separation, no more death. To dwell in the heavenly places. In my Father's house are many mansions, Jesus said. And so that equally is part of our hope. We know we will get it. 
We just don't have it at the, mo at the moment. We will see God's throne. We will see God's glory. We will see the new Jerusalem. There are all these wonderful things that will be given to us following the resurrection. We don't see them yet, but Paul prays that their understanding may be enlightened, that they may know it's part of the hope. Secondly, the glorious riches of his inheritance. God is so generous that the inheritance, and inheritance is something that's mentioned a number of times in Scripture. We don't need to go into it today, but each believer receives an inheritance. And this is not an inheritance because uh, in the earthly sense that somebody dies and we receive their goods. Um, well, Jesus died and rose again, but he has prepared a wonderful, gracious gift to every believer. Some believe, many believers will receive a rich reward. Some believers will receive very small rewards. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But nonetheless, each one of us, there will be no jealousy. There will be no guilt. There will be no, oh, look what he's got and I haven't got it. We will be so overwhelmed, or to use that word, gobsmacked with what the Lord gives us following the resurrection. We will never bother with what somebody else has. Look what I've got. It's so amazing. And so that is the glorious riches of his inheritance in Christ Jesus. Well, that was the second thing. But the third thing that Paul asks, that our minds might be enlightened to understand, is the greatness of the power of God. The greatness of the power of God. Part of the scandal of the modern era of man, and I think particularly with the church, is we've allowed people to strip God of his majesty and power. Well, of course, that was, that was their attack. That was what they were aiming to do. That was precisely what some of these unbelievers, atheists and agnostics, were wanting to do, was throw God off his throne and put man's wisdom in its place. And uh, part of that was to attract, uh, attribute everything to natural laws and uh, forgetting God who made those laws, forgetting God who created everything, God who set the whole of creation in motion with all its astonishing complexity and beauty. They have forgotten God and they've forgotten to reveal, to, they've forgotten that he has revealed his power. Well, this is what Paul prays for. I never stop thanks, giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray the perception of your mind may be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints, and the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his vast strength. I might just suggest to you, here is a wonderful model prayer to pray not only for others, but there really is nothing at all preventing us from praying this for ourselves. Well, may that encourage you in your prayer life. And so once again, until next week, where we've got part four of the series, although these are not the only prayers of Paul in the epistles, um, I do pray that once again the Lord will richly bless you, encourage you, strengthen you, and keep you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.